Good morning and welcome to Sound Travels. This is, my name is Pastor Dan Walker. I am privileged to pastor the New Bethel Baptist Church in Framingham, Mass. Welcome to a great show, what I hope to be a great show today. As you know, the, today is the anniversary, the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. And my goal today is to talk about the the man, the myth, let's say the man, the myth, and the legend, some people would say, um, the humanity of Dr. Martin Luther King has been called into question lately. There are people out there that say that um, not only was he not a prophet, he wasn't even a man of God. And because he wasn't even a man of God, then the civil rights movement itself uh, was a fraud. I have heard this. I've been trying to get, there's some very eloquent speakers on this. I've been trying to get them to come on the, uh, the program and to express their opinions, they can certainly do it better than I because they believe it. And one of the, one of the things that is uh, held against him, Dr. Martin Luther King, was his infidelities. To say that he was a perfect man or to say that he was a man that uh, never did anything wrong in his life, in his marriage, or even in his ministry would be a lie. The man had issues and his issues are now well known. It is a point of fact that he did commit adultery many times throughout his um, marriage. The FBI bugged his hotel room on numerous occasions and recorded these infidelities. Um, and because of that, there are people out there that say that this disqualifies him for being a servant of God. We have a call. Good morning, caller. You're on the air. Good morning, Pastor Dan. How are you? Good morning. I'm fine. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, Sound Travels is proud to present to some and introduce to others Mother Ann Parrish with Mom's Corner. Well, Pastor Dan, it's something just, I've been reading, you know, reading God's Word. And I've noticed something. You know, we serve a very precise God. I 
was looking at um, when he told the to, uh, Moses how to build the tabernacle. As you begin to read that, you begin to see that God is very pacific in what he tells us to do and how he, how he tells us to do it. And, you know, even today, we have to be careful that when we tell people what to do and how to do it as children of God, we have to be very specific. We have to be very on point because the God we serve is an on point God. When he got through telling them how to build it. They didn't have to ask a hundred questions because he had made it very plain. And we, as you know, I, I listen to how we as children of God talk to each other. And a lot of times the other person will walk away saying, what? But we're not supposed to leave anybody wondering, especially about the Word of God. We're not supposed to leave anyone doubting. We, as messengers of God, are supposed to be just that specific. If you read the Ten Commandments, they are very specific. They spell it out. When you read the book of Leviticus, the law makes it very, very plain. There's no if, answer, but. And yet today we've taken it and we've got clauses and addendums and everything. And you wonder why the world is so confused. Because we are no longer a on-point, specific world. God spoke he spoke specific. When he told the son to come forth, he didn't tell it maybe, if, well, if you feel like it, he said, come forth. It knew what it was supposed to do. And it did it. And we have to be the same way as we talk to other people about God. We have to be specific so they will see the God that we serve and want to serve him. Amen. Wow. <laughs> Specific in the service of the Lord. That's right. Well, thank you. You know, I don't know if I, if I remember to remember to mention it to you. Today we're going to be, we're focusing on Dr. Martin Luther King and my my idea this morning is to talk about the man um, the, and, you know, the myths and the different legends about him. Did you have, uh, he, he was more prevalent during your time than he was mine. I was young, I was very young when he was assassinated. Did you have any thoughts on him? Good, well, bad? You know, <laughs> you know uh, yes, the same thing. Dr. Martin Luther King was very specific about nonviolence. He, as he marched, as he talked, he talked the same thing. Every city he went in, every state he went in, his message didn't change. It didn't change because he was in Alabama. Then he went to Mississippi. It didn't change. It was the same message. And that's what I'm, I'm, that's what I'm talking about. Just like Dr. King was very specific, very on point. You knew what he stood for. You knew what he was about. You didn't have to wonder because he made it very plain to you that this is the way it should 
pay. And that's what the same thing with us. As we go about God's business, we have to be very, very specific. Because Dr. King Ross, he was he was an awesome man. He he was he believed in what he taught, what he preached, what he lived. And it's a shame to say he was willing to die for it. Are we willing to die for our belief? Wow. <laughs> That actually comes down to it. That is exactly the point. Are you willing to die for your belief? And you told me the joke a long time ago about the guy who came into the church in the middle of the revival, pulled out his weapon, and said, all of you so-called, all you Christians need to get out of here. All you, and and the, the church emptied out except for two or three people. He said, I'm telling you, if you're still here, by the time I count to, to five, I'm going to kill everybody in here. And everybody left except one old lady. And he said, looked at her and said, ma'am, don't you understand I'm about to kill you? She said, for God I live and for God I die. He said, told, look up the preacher, said, okay, now you can preach because the Christians are here. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. I remember that to this day, obviously, because that is the type of faith that we really do need to have. Yes. And people need to be clear on our message, and people need to understand exactly who we are and what we stand for. And I think the fact that he was not a perfect man, I don't really think that detracts from his message at all. No. No. God didn't use perfect people. Thank you. God used imperfect people to get his message across. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Ordinary people. I love that song. <laughs> God uses ordinary people. He used imperfect people. Everybody God used was imperfect. Starting from Adam down to Paul. When you read, they all had a default. Absolutely. But they were they were willing to say, For God I live and for God I die. And that's what Dr. King was. He was in person because he was human. Exactly. But he had one agenda. And he marched forth with that agenda, whether there was water, whether there was dogs, whether there was clubs, whether it was rainy, whether it was sunshine. He had one agenda, and he said, I'm willing to die for it. This is what I believe. You can't change me. You can't rearrange me. And whatever it takes. I will do. Amen. Get my one agenda through. Amen. Well, thank you for calling in this morning. I'm 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 so blessed to have a mother like you. Uh, to have someone who uh, has their head on sho her head straightly on their shoulders and clear and defined. I think this is one of your best messages yet. We have to be clear. We have to stand for who we are, what we believe. And never mind who doesn't like it. And never mind the fact that we have our issues. The issues do not matter. It's true. Because if God, true. You know, God knew who he called, he knows why he called us. That's right. And if we spend time worrying about the reasons we can't do it, then only one that gets the victory out of that is the devil. That's right. Because every time God tells you what you can do, he's going to be in your ear telling you what you can't do. That's why. Or what you shouldn't do. Or what, how, how dare you think that you could even consider doing it. Right. Wow. That yeah, was wonderful. It's not about what are you willing to live for. It's about what are you willing to die for. Wow. <laughs>
I'm, I've got chills. <laughs> That's the key right there. Yeah. Well, mommy, we, we're too busy looking at what am I living for? But no, it, it, it may come down to what are you willing to die for? Ultimately, it always comes down to that. That's right. Ultimately. That's right. Because none of us get out of this world alive. No, no. Okay. No. So, you know, I, I, I'll never forget when somebody asked me what, uh, when, I, when I was first voted in as pastor, um, I had someone came to me and said, Don't, aren't you concerned that, because they said, we know you, you're going to just work yourself to death. Aren't you concerned that this, this whole thing could be too much for you, that you could, you're going to kill yourself doing this? And I looked at him, and I was very plain about my answer, and it wasn't pretty. I said, I'd rather die in the poor pulpit than the whorehouse. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And that's got to be the case. We've got to be willing to die doing the right thing. That's right. So it is that's what it right. is. It ain't going to be pretty, but it is what it is. Thanks for calling right. this morning. This is you've been a great start for our program. All right. Love you. You all be blessed in the Lord. Have a blessed day. I love you all. And goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. That's That is Mother Ann Parrish from St. Paul Missionary Baptist Church of Akron, Ohio. Obviously, that's my mother. And that was Mom's Corner. We have, a, we have another caller. Good morning, caller. You're on the air. Good morning. Good morning, Pastor Walker. This is Pastor Elsa. Hi, Pastor and, uh, Elsa. Yes, and thanks be to God. That was very good what um, Mother Harry said. I am a great-grandmother, and I have something to say also. And it's right. If you're not willing to die for something, then you're not willing to die. You'll die for nothing. I truly believe that. And if you try to save your life, then you will lose it. And the Bible says that. Because it's not only, we have to look at eternity. You know, people don't talk about eternity. They don't want to talk about hell and heaven. But it's two kingdoms. And we have to look at that. And we have to look, you know, you were talking, I'm putting, uh, giving an input of him, Dr. King, and you were talking about his adultery. No man is perfect. You know, one, one evangelist, she passed away now, she told me, we all put our pants on the same way. Some, because when I became a Christian, I was always in the world. I don't hide it. And this has been my greatest work when I did evangelistic work is that we try to, when we get saved, we try to pretend that we never sin. And, you know, and I tell people, it's not only adultery that you sin. Gossiping is a sin. You understand? I think adultery, killing, fornication, and all that is a big sin. God put every sin that we do, and if you say you're sinless, then you're lying to yourself. Exactly. Because, you know, when... When I talk to my ch grandchildren especially, I let them know what is real in the Christian world. Because when I came into the Christian world, because I was in the world, I thought everybody was perfect. And I had a great disillusion. Absolutely. And if, I focus, if I didn't focus on Jesus, I would have I went back into the world. But I spent time in the Bible... I spend time, I have a relation, a close relationship with, with Jesus on a daily basis. And he speaks to me, not in an audio way, but in my heart. And that's where it is. And we have to train the young generation these things. Because, you see, I have... You Pastor, know, I have, Pastor, yes? I do appreciate you. We're going to move on. I know you guys always come me off, but thank you. Thank, thank you. you. God bless you. God bless. We're focusing on the man, the myth, the legend that is Dr. Martin Luther King. 
And I think we've actually had two great ideas concerning him. Um, I asked, a, I was getting gas at a gas station this morning, and I noticed a man who across the way at the other pump. So I asked him, I said, pardon me, may I just ask you a question? And it's not going to be an easy question, so you can just tell me to pound sand if you wish. But do you think that the minority community is better now after the civil rights movement or do you think it's the same as this? Uh, are we worse off than the civil rights movement or are we better than the civil rights movement? And as I said, I've been talking with a friend of mine recently, good brother, good brother in the Lord. But this brother is thoroughly convinced that we are, that the black race or the minority race is actually worse now than it ever was during the civil, before civil rights. And I asked him if he would come on today, and he's, he's working, so he's not able to come on. But I, 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 one day I would like to get at least somebody who believes that the minority race is worse off now than we were before civil rights. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a, a theory that, uh, it's a theory, certainly, but it's not a belief that I personally share. Because if you think about it, W. B. P. G. Boston Praise Radio could not exist, could not have existed if it wasn't for a civil rights movement. The fact that we're drive that that black people or minorities in general are driving cars could not exist. Now I understand that. This is not a perfect system. I understand that there are still inequities. I, I get the fact that the black race has still a long way to go. I, I do get that. But I, I, I question the throwing the baby out with the bathwater theory. I think that what Dr. Martin Luther King did was he shined a light on the complete inequities of our society. I believe that now I have heard um, Dr. Uh, Walters, um, a devout man of God, um, first, pos first, so we say, turn me on to this particular theory of Dr. Martin Luther King being the last modern day prophet. Now, when I said that to some people, uh, you would have thought that I had called him a name because they said well there's no way this man could have been a prophet he was a dog and I said well what do you mean well he was you know doing all of this stuff yes he was preaching in the pulpit in the evening but what he was doing throughout the night was reprehensible and some would say that even the day the night uh, before his assassination that he was not in this hotel room alone <clears throat> that he was actually in, in, in bed with a woman that wasn't his wife. Um, I don't dismiss the man's actions, not for one second. And I don't dismiss what some would consider to be a monumental betrayal. Um, but one of the things that I have come to believe is that the nature of all ministry is based in betrayal. If you look at Jesus the Christ, who walked with 12 people, one of which betrayed him, but ultimately all of them abandoned him. So, it's not, I don't want to say it's, I don't want to say the word fair, but I, I want to say that it's not relevant so much as to what the man's issues were as it can, I, oh, here's the okay here we go how can it be relevant to me if it wasn't relevant to God who called him I believe to this position you see that becomes the issue when God calls you he knows who you are he knows where you are and if you look at history you discover that when God called anybody, he never t 
turn them different from what they were. He just used what he had in them. In other words, when Jesus called the disciples, he called them and he said, come, I will make, if you follow me, I will make you fishers of men. He didn't say to the fishers that I'm going to turn you into carpenters. He didn't say to the carpenters, if you come follow me, I'm going to now turn you into painters. He said, I'm going to make you fishers of men, meaning that I'm going to teach you how to be more proficient at what you're used to doing, which is to go out into the water, cast a net, and bring in fish. Now you're going to go out into the world, cast your net, and bring in disciples. It's the same concept. I'm just going to show you how to do it on a more efficient level and, and, and in a way that it's going to be more useful to the kingdom. So I think that if you, if, if you understand what a prophet is, a prophet is not a perfect person. A prophet is not a, a, a sinless person. A prophet isn't necessarily someone that completely believes in God. Because if we go to the prophet Balaam, if we study our word, we discover that Balaam believed in God. Yes, he did. But he also believed in many gods. And because he was a prophet for hire, he responded to you if you came to him in the terms that you set before him. In other words, if you asked him for an answer, he would try to find out which God you wanted the answer from and get you that answer. So this is a um, this is clearly an example of a prophet who is not, um, shall we say, pure. Well, obviously, he's not pure because he's a prophet for hire. And when the, when the people approach him, they approach him based on the fact that he is a prophet for hire. They ask that he, they, go, he, they, they want to have Israel cursed. And Balaam says, well, I can't. Uh, I'm sorry, am I saying Balaam or Balak? I may, I may, I may be saying Balaam. Uh, I'm sure one of my Bible, one of my scholar friends will call me and correct it. And when you get old, your brain wanders. <laughs> um, the point being is that because he was a prophet for hire, when he had to go to God, the Father, and request a, uh, an answer, he went back and he told the people, well, I can only tell you what God tells me. I, and I, they want him to curse the people, but God has told me to bless them. Well, they don't like that. And he doesn't like that because he's in a position where if he does what he's told to do, he's going to become very rich. And see, this is the issue. When you look at the life of Dr. Martin Luther King, you can't say that it was a life that was uh, that rich that unduly rich enriched him. Uh, he did not gain great wealth throughout his ministry. His wife and him and his kids lived in a modest home. It never changed. Uh, he was arrested many, many times. He was beat on several different occasions and juxtapose that with the fact that yes he was human and i don't and i think we do a disservice to the to the man if we elevate his status to that of legend without the understanding that he was wholly human you see and because and and because his infidelities I'm not going to say they didn't matter to God because God does not like ugly and God does not want us to be it, it, it does not want us to be two-minded and double-tongued and all that stuff. Of course it matters to God. But the mission that God had placed on him was far more important and the message that he brought was far more important. And here's the other part that all prophets had to go through all prophets had to to uh, to do when they did 
that which they were called to do, then they were removed from the scene or they faded from the scene. And in this situation, when we go back to the prophet Balaam, uh, we discover that he ultimately dies with the people that God has told him not to have contact with. God has told him specifically that these are bad people because they want my people cursed. Balaam finds a way to give them what they want. They give him riches. Rather than him take the riches and run, he, they keep him close and he ends up dying with them. So the riches that he acquired don't really do him any good or much good at all. And see, this is the trick of the enemy, and this is exactly what Satan wants you to do. He wants you, if you are following the one true God, he wants you to follow, but just far enough away so that you never get the real message or you never get the real benefit from your belief in God. See, this becomes a real problem if you don't understand the lies and the trickeries that the enemy use. So, yes, Dr. Martin Luther King, and, you know, then another thing that was brought out is that, well, he didn't write his own speeches, and he didn't write the Free at Last speech, and he didn't write the Mountaintop speech. And my response to that is, so what? Really, so what? Every Sunday morning in every church in America and every church around the world, preachers are preaching from a book they didn't write. We're serving a God that we didn't make. We're speaking words that have been placed in our spirits and placed on our heart. But we did not come up with these words. It would be far easier, and it is far easier to be a sinner than it ever could be to be a saint. The average person would not choose salvation if you, if you truly laid out what it is. If Dr. King had been told, listen, I'm going to have you come out and do this, and at the end of it, you're going to die on a balcony because somebody's going to shoot you. How many people would, would say, okay, I'm going to go do your will because I know I'm going to die in the balcony. This is my goal. I'm going to do it. And the answer to that is it'd be really few people that would ever have that commitment or even consider that commitment to want to do something like that. So when I say to you that it is extremely possible that Dr. Martin Luther King was the last or, or to date has been the, the last of the modern day prophets, uh, I would like to hear somebody to, to comment on that. I don't know if we'll get a chance to have people call in, but the call-in numbers are 617-282-0685, 617-282-7794, or 617-265-2679. Uh, do you think Dr. Martin Luther King was a prophet? If so, why? If not, why? Do you think that his um, infidelities disqualify him for the service of the Lord? Do you think that his, the whole civil rights movement was a sham? Do you think that black people are no better off than they ever were because of the civil rights movement? I think if you were to look at all of these things, I think you have to be objective about it. M numbers may say, that yes, we're still in the same situation. Yes, there are more black people in prison than there are in the war. Uh, you know, we have a 13% minority, but 50% prison population. Uh, to me, that's not an indication that black people caught, commit more crimes. It's an indication to me that the political structure wants to incarcerate more black people, which means that what are they afraid of? It always, you know, when somebody's after somebody, you know, they say, look for the money, follow the money to see where the money's going, and that'll tell you what the truth is. Um, I met somebody who uh, was a fellow Clevelander. He said he was from Cleveland. I said, 
uh, he happened to be a Caucasian gentleman, and I said, where in Cleveland? And he said, well, kind of the east side. I said, where are you from? I'm from Cleveland. I know Cleveland. Well, I'm from Brexville. Okay, Brexville is not Cleveland. Brexville, it, Brexville was a Caucasian suburb on the outskirts of Cleveland, and they habitually would stop any minority vehicle coming into their city if there was so much as a taillight that was out or a headlight that was out. I know because I grew up in Cleveland and I drove cars that weren't always perfect. And before I crossed into any suburb, Brexville was one of them. Uh, I had to make sure that all my headlights were working, all my taillights, my turn signal. I had to make sure the car wasn't smoking too much. In other words, I had to have no reason for the cops to pull me over because they were going to if they saw anything. And that was the, that was the time I grew up. That was Brexville. That was not just Brexville. That was Parma. That was not just Parma. That was Lorraine. That was not. In other words, it was actually Shaker Heights for, for a, a period of time. It was Warrensville Heights for a period of time. And now if you go back to Ohio, Shaker Heights and Warrensville Heights are, are, are heavily minority, minority populated. If you go to Cleveland, it's, it, it's almost a ghost town in terms of uh, Caucasian population. They, they moved further away and moved further away. And that's another question. Why is it when uh, minorities move into a neighborhood, Caucasians move out? But these are all questions that have to speak to the issue of race relations. And what Dr. King was saying was that it's time that we begin to look at people and judge them by the content of their character and not the color of their skin. You see, the whole message of whether King was uh, a prophet or whether King was an effective leader uh, always falls to what are the results of what he did and not so much the issues he had while doing them. Because, let's face it, how many presidents were perfect? Yes, we understand that Bill Clinton had uh, sexual relations in the White House. This is not, um, this is not a guess. This is not a joke. This is, this is actual, uh, this has been proven. But he's not the first president to do it. We have a caller. Good morning, Carl. You're on the air. Good morning, Reverend. How are you? I'm doing well. Good, uh, good. This is uh, Pastor Stanley Dees. Hi, Pastor Dees. Of uh, Spirit and Truth Baptist Church. Hi, Pastor Dees of Spirit and Truth Baptist Church. Did you call in to comment about Dr. Mo Martin Luther King? I did. And, and, and you uh, know, um, I, I just felt compelled that I, I need to have to say something for Dr. King, because, you know, I lived during that period of time when Dr. King was here, and he made a strong impact on my life. I'm sure he made a strong impact on your life and many others. But uh, because he was a drum major for equality and justice for all, uh, where, where there was social injustice, he, he was able to bring it together and join in brotherhood. Uh, where there was spiritual darkness, he cultivated faith. You know, he, he brought that darkness into light. And it, it, it brought a, a particular thought to my mind. Uh, concerning Dr. King and what his message was and what his purpose was and what his life was all about. It reminded me of uh, a scripture in the book of Proverbs. And it says that where there is no vision, the people perish. When, wow. when people have nothing to look forward to or when they have no goals, no objectives, no revelation or communication from God. 
they have nothing to prepare themselves for, and when they have nothing to prepare themselves for, they have no hope, no aspirations, and, and no ambition. They, they cast off restraints, and they lose control. And where there is ignorance of God, crime and sin just run wild. You wow. see, and, and as we look around us, we see that division and destruction go hand in hand because where there's no vision, or I should say where there is vision, there's opposition. So, yes. what, what I'm hearing you say is... The fact that Dr. King had a vision. Yes, um, he did. And the vision is what sustained you because he said, this is what you can do. This is where you can go and this is who you can be. Yes. Did it matter to you any, did, like when you discovered that he was human, did that matter? Did that change his message at all? No, it didn't change it. Because, see, you can't change truth. Wow. Truth can be said by anybody. Truth can, be, truth can actually be stated by a liar. That is true. That is, very, that is correct. So, because even, even a fool can utter truth. He may not understand it. He may not even know why he's doing it. But truth is truth. So, as a young man growing up in the Boston area, listening to Dr. King, what, is there any one particular thing that inspired you to pursue the ministry? Well, other than the fact that uh, uh, when God places his hand on you, there's no escape. I noticed uh, that the environment in which, uh, that I grew up in, uh, there were good and bad uh, people. I'm talking about young people then, uh, but back when I was in my teens. And I found that because my mother raised me in the church, I was very familiar with what church life was all about. And because I was raised up in the projects, I realized what street life was all about. I found that there was less tension in the church. There, I was more at ease. I could be more of myself, who I really wanted to be when I was in church than when I was out of church. Um, there were periods of time when I was not affiliated with the church, and during those periods of time, life got very hectic, very intense. I was always looking over my shoulder. And then when I went back to church, all of that eased off me like a burden. And so I knew that church had to be the place uh, in order for me to have the kind of life that I wanted to have. I was more at ease. Dr. King helped that in a great I understood that he went and got an ed I'm sorry, that was me. Oh boy. He brought it back to his people. He brought it back to, to pay back um, the, the, the gift of God that was given to him. And when I saw that, you see, that, that said to me that, that, you know, I want to be like him. I want to be the kind of person that can bring about a change, not only in my life, but in the lives of those um, that I come in contact with. Amen. I've been trying to do that ever since. That's wonderful. Hang on a second. I have another caller coming in. I want to see how I can change, how I can bring them both in mm -hmm. at the same time. Hang on. Uh, 
Good morning, caller. You're on the air. Well, how you doing today, Pastor? Good morning. I don't. I. I so, um, I just cut the, the. I just cut Pastor D's off. I wasn't intending to. I was trying to see how I can bring both calls at the same time. Lock yes. Um, and push that. He's gone. He's gone. Hello. Okay, I'm right here. All right. So, uh, so caller, you have uh, something you'd like to say? Uh, yes, I was very enlightened by uh, what was what you're putting out there. I mean, it's outstanding, and I was very enlightened by the pastor. I was listening to you. I was very enlightened by what the pastor was saying, um, especially about the truth. Yes. Uh, other things that surrounded his life did not take away from the truth. Um, we can look at that to try to take down and deteriorate what he was doing, but the truth will stand by itself. I wrote a poem long time ago about such a thing. If I may be permitted to read it, I would like to read it. Go right ahead. The title of the poem called is called "It's Time for a Change." Hang on a second. Don't go. Don't go away. He's keep talking. Keep talking. Go ahead. Uh, the title of the poem called "It's Time for a Change." Back in the beginning, there was Adam and Eve. They committed a sin, a bad one indeed. Time moved forward, and slavery was born, and that's when the history of our world was torn. Hatred was at an all-time high, and for the sins of the world, someone had to die. So God sent Jesus without hesitation, because he knew that his death would be our only salvation. So the world was divided, and we had our own land. We were back in Africa, in total command. So let's talk about when we were kings and queens, and people were treated like human beings. Our heads we held high as we did our jobs, and always gave thanks and praise to our God. Then we were sold back into slavery by our own race. And once again, hatred showed its ugly face. But times have changed. It's a different day, so they say. But to me, it just don't seem that way. People say things are changing. It's just a matter of time. But we're still stuck in slavery because it's stuck in our mind. They took the chains off our hands, so we put them on our necks. And people with wisdom still gets no respect. Rosa Parks made a big fuss so we could sit on the front of the bus. But we get on the bus and run straight to the back and right on the walls. So Rosa Parks' struggle meant nothing at all. Have you ever heard of Dr. Martin Luther King? Well, let's take a minute to remember his dream. Free at last, free at last. It's a cry to the future with a voice from the past. They put away the whips, they stop beating our brothers. So we pick up the guns and start killing each other. For some Air Jordans, a leather jacket, or even the color red. Leaves one brother incarcerated, another brother dead. So please stop the violence so our parents won't cry. Because black on black crime is at an all time high. We blame it on the media, the newspapers, with our Bibles thrown on the shelf. It's time we take a deep hard look at ourselves. If we really want to make a change, we must first start to change the hatred and bitterness that's built in our hearts. So let's turn to God and change our mind, because now it's a day of salvation, and now it's the appointed time. It's time for change. Thank you. Amen. Thank you for calling in. I appreciate that. Uh, do, is the other, is the, uh, Pastor Dees, are you back with us? I am. Okay. <laughs> we have two, so, uh, I'm going to let people in on a little secret. This is Elder Lipford. Elder Lipford, Pastor yes, Dees. Uh, Pastor Dees, can you hear Elder Lipford? I can. Elder Dees, can you, uh, Pastor Dees, uh, Elder, oh my goodness. Elder Lipford, can you hear Pastor Dees? Yes, I can. All right, great. So now you both are on at the same time. <laughs> uh, just learning this electronic stuff is always interesting. I just want to tell you why I was why I'm listening to you. I was very enlightened by what you said, Pastor. Very yeah. enlightened mm -hmm. and very so much so much true. I could tell that you are an upstanding man of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Wow. This is you know this is interesting because 
as I said, I have a lot of people in my ears lately telling me that I have to understand more about the struggle, understand more about where we are as a black people and understand more about the truth of the nation and, and black nationalism and, and all this stuff. And I'm wondering if that's true. If, do I need to understand that or do I need to focus on the gospel and the good news? And do I need to, uh, to, to just go ahead and do what God tells me to do in terms of reaching out to, the, to his people with a, with a positive message. In other words, it, is it important that I'm black? Well, let, let me, me, let me um, chime in. Okay. Because you see, uh, personally, uh, God's message is the best message. God's word is the best word. God's direction is the best direction. We, we, yeah. we can talk and we can talk, and this is what we've been doing for so many years now. But you see, the thing is, is that when we talk about black folks and, and people that need to come together and work together to bring about results in their life, uh, black folks need to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. Because, you see, we cannot expect other people around us to change. We need to be the change. Come on now. Come on now. Okay, we need to get up and do something rather than just run our mouths. We need to take action. This and we need to step out of this comfort zone that all of us find ourselves in and start making a difference in our own life and in the lives of those around us, so doc, our people. So, Dr. Uh, we need to start, start coming. I mean, you see, it doesn't matter who's in charge. What does matter is the dedication of those that we follow, those that, that, that we are working with, that we bring about the good, strong, positive results in our own life and what we are attempting to do for ourselves. If we don't do it, it won't get done. So the message of Dr. Martin Luther King reigns supreme even today in that it doesn't really matter where you start from or, or even who you are. It only matters if you are clear about your message, if you're clear that God is calling you to do what he's calling you to do. I, I thoroughly believe that uh, he, he may have started out the civil rights thing, uh, maybe not so clear as to what was what he was to be doing. It, it may have been cute and fun, but I think it got real to him pretty quickly. I think uh, he understood, and I, th I think when he's defining his death, when he's foretelling of his death, I don't see that as being a joke. I don't see that as being... Um, I, don't, I, I think that was a moment of clarity, if, as, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, I listen, I've listened to that speech many times, and he says, uh, when he says, we've got some difficult days ahead, but that really doesn't matter to me now. Just that sentence right there should, is, should tell you that something has changed. Right. Well, what you see is you're going to find people that's going to throw up a smoke stream, a facade. They're trying to get you off of the message and more or less looking at the person. What we need to remember at all times, it is not who we are, it's whose we are. See, if of ourselves we are nothing, but of God we are everything. Elder? Like you said earlier, there's not one perfect prophet. Thank you, Elder. Other than you, huh? We're running out of time. I had to do this. Uh, Pastor Dees, would you give us a call back on, on another Wednesday? Uh, yes, I will. Elder Lipford, could you give us a call on another Wednesday? Yes, it would be my pleasure. All right. Well, this has been Sound Travels. We thank you both for, for, for calling in. We thank you, uh, Mother Parrish for Mom's Corner. 
with the, with the idea that we have to be very specific about our message. We thank all you who are listening, and we just ask God right now that you bless each and every one of us in our respective ministries and carry us through to the next week. And just as we, as we go forward, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Hear me, hear me.